Hi, the topic of today's talk is neural sparse voxel fields. So as a reminder, we are trying to do realistic novel view synthesis. We've recently achieved a breakthrough on this task with neural radiance fields, or NERF. But the issue is that NERF's quality is not always so great, and it can also be extremely slow. So the quality is not great for this example. It's very blurry. We can hardly see what's happening. And it also takes 30 seconds per frame. So a reason why we would might want um, higher speeds at inference time is for this application of um, virtual exploration of a scene. So we have a virtual character moving in a virtual room and to do this we essentially want dense view interpolation from a sparser set of views. Of course we'd like for this to be done in high quality and in real time and um, the method that is shown here uh, has many artifacts. So we would like the quality of something like NERF but also uh, the speed of this mesh method. The good news is that this method that we're talking about, NSVF, uh, appeared not long after NERF, and both the quality and speed is much better. So as a high-level summary of what this uh, extension of NERF has done, is that essentially they do sampling along the rays much more efficiently uh, using a sparse voxel data structure, and this also allows them to do very detailed modeling of local properties of the scene. So to understand the issue at hand here, we'll do a quick recap of how NERF does its sampling. So for each pixel, we need to integrate colors along this viewing ray to form the new image, from, to form the image from a novel view. And to make this integration tractable, we want to sample at the most relevant places, which is near the surface intersection of the ray. The issue is that how do we know where to sample in the first place? So the idea in NERF is to use coarse sampling to guide our next round of sampling. The issue of the strategy is that we use a lot of computation sampling in empty space. And since the first round is so coarse, we um, also sample a bunch in empty space during the second round. So can we remember which places are empty? And can we do it with a data structure that is multi-view consistent? And according to the authors, the answer is yes. We can use voxels to remember where we need to sample from. And we can do this, uh, we can still do this with a scene representation that is continuous. So we'll still use an MLP to predict our volume densities and colors. So the good thing about this is that now we can very quickly check for where to sample using ray voxel intersections. And of course, we want to be able to quickly identify which uh, we don't want to do intersection tests with all of the voxels in our scene. So we'll see how we can speed this um, test up. And essentially, we'll use an octree so that the um, search is hierarchical. We don't want to test every single voxel in the scene. So the idea is that if an intersection occurs with a voxel, it must have occurred with its bounding volume. So we only need to check the larger bounding volumes, the parents of the leaf nodes, um, in order to ascertain if we need to check the children of uh, each of these nodes. And essentially, we can skip a lot of intersection tests by uh, checking the parents first. So now we have a way to do fast and precise sampling using sparse voxels. But there's actually another advantage. and what the authors noted is that you can place learnable embeddings in the corners of each voxel, and this will help detail modeling a lot. So as you can see here, to get an input to our continuous representation MLP, we'll simply spatially interpolate these embeddings as an input to our MLP, and this will provide additional local information about uh, the geometry, materials, and color within each of the voxels. And as you can see, um, the embeddings do help the detail modeling quite a bit. So as a summary for inference, we'll very quickly find the intersections for each ray, we'll sample within each of the intersected voxels, and we'll accumulate the color along each ray in the same way as NERF to form the final uh, color at that image location. And I'll talk in more detail about how this is done now.
So to do this integration, we're going to want to use the midpoint rule to do a piecewise constant approximation uh, for each segment that we are sampling within the voxel. Um, so we'll evaluate our MLP at these midpoints. And the input to our MLP is the interpolated embeddings from the corners of this voxel. And the MLP output is the volume density sigma and the color C. And delta is the length of the segment. So when using the midpoint rule, the total volume density for a segment is just the product of its length and the midpoint volume density. And uh, we'll use this idea to define our alpha value for the segment. So as you can see, the higher the volume density or length, the higher the alpha value, um, which is like how much light gets blocked. And we'll define our transmittance T as the ratio of light that has managed to reach this segment. So the ratio of light R consumed by the segment is the product of the segment alpha and the current transmittance. So as an example, when alpha is 1, the ratio of light consumed by the segment is just the ratio of light uh, remaining T. Now this ratio also is the weight of the color in this integral that we are approximating. And finally, we'll have to decrement um, or update our transmittance based on how much color, uh, how much light was consumed by the segment. Of course, if T is below some threshold, uh, to save time, we're going to want to terminate the algorithm early. But if it isn't, we'll repeat the process for the next segment and decrement T, just like we did. Um, and if we run out of samples and we still have some transmittance, then we will spend the rest of it on a constant background term. So this will model the background of the whole scene. And it's not the greatest modeling assumption and is a limitation of this method. So that roughly covers um, algorithm one and some of the equations in the paper. So you might ask at this point, well, how do we get the voxels in the first place? And the issue is that we don't know where anything is at the beginning of training, so we'll just have to start with a dense voxel field. And occasionally we'll remove or prune a voxel if all of its corners fall below some threshold. And it's called pruning um, because of uh, its this analogy with real life pruning. So the issue of this naive strategy though is that for high res, the, you might begin with too many voxels. So we would like to avoid this unnecessary uh, computation and uh, do our computations at the right level of detail. So the idea is that um, we start by pruning large voxels, and then we'll progressively subdivide these voxels to get smaller ones, and we'll repeat this process. So this is what it looks like. And at each stage of training, we use an appropriate level of detail for computational efficiency. The loss function is very similar to other NERF papers. Um, there's this additional term that encourages the transmittance to be either 0 or 1 and reduces some artifacts. Um, so actually, um, an interesting thing about this work is that the storage space is not much worse than NERF. And it's also much faster. So here, the x-axis is the foreground to background ratio, the y-axis is runtime. As we move along the x-axis to the right, we have more foreground. More foreground means more voxels that are intersected, and so NSVF has a runtime that increases. On the other hand, NERF is always constantly slow since it takes a fixed number of samples per ray. And as you can see, the quality is also better than NERF. Uh, the details are modeled better. And you should check the videos out. I think they're, they're also quite impressive. It can also be applied for scene editing. So here we train a shared MLP for each scene. And the main difference between each scene is encoded actually in their voxel embeddings. Uh, this is impossible to do with NERF. Um, and finally, I'll show some of the results for large-scale scene rendering. As you can see, it has much fewer artifacts than the method I showed at the beginning. So that brings us to some uh, critiques and limitations. Um, as the authors say, the self-pruning threshold is a bit arbitrary and may not be ideal for thin structures. 
Um, it requires known camera poses, and it's still not great for more complicated effects. So here, uh, refraction is not captured very well. Um, on the left is the output of their method. And one thing that I think they may have been able to do better is um, disentangle the effects of sampling from detail modeling. So it would be it would have been interesting to see what the uh, gains of subdividing more than f three or four times are, and if there's some beneficial implicit regularization uh, for using larger voxels on their embeddings. So as a recap, the key insight is to use a sparse voxel data structure to avoid sampling empty space and to also enable detailed modeling of local scene properties. And the result is that um, we're in order of magnitude faster than NERF and we can uh, render new views at a higher quality.